today I'm going to talk about, uh, it's, it's more or less um, uh, has something to do with, uh, well, kind of uh, bursting a bubble. I mean, uh, there's a lot of designers out there, and there's um, unfortunately a lot of mistakes, and we usually don't hear about the mistakes because uh, uh, mistakes that are made in design, they usually don't make it to the marketplace, and, and they basically disappear. Um, but I want to kind of um, talk about mistakes that people make, and uh, because I, obviously I want your unique designs to be successful, but you have to be realistic about them as well. So my talk is called The Perils of Unconventional Aircraft Design, but it actually applies to more than just aircraft. For some reason, do I have to point this at something? Or? Okay, okay. So unconventional aircraft design, are these a stroke of genius or an attack of eccentricity? So I want to talk about some, some design-related issues at first, and, and of course this is not a complete list, and, and it depends on what uh, uh, part or, or, or a product you're designing, whether it applies, it doesn't necessarily apply to everything, um, but something for you to think about. Why, but why is it that some designs are fare so much better than others. And why is it, what is sets a good design apart from a bad one? And these are actually pretty big questions. The um, design can be considered a creative work or object intended to serve some purpose, and ideally it should fill, fill a particular need. Think about a broom. Um, we need to sweep the floor, and uh, we have this design, this tool, this object to take care of that. A design developed for business requires audience, customers or consumer. A successful design satisfies the need of the customer and sometimes even helps him or her discover that there's such, such a need. And I, I think the best example of that is, is the iPhone or the, or the mobile phone, is that if you think about it, if you go to a desert island, you will realize you don't really need the phone. It's not that, but today, if I take your phones away, you're gonna be very, very upset. And it's really a pseudo need uh, that um, some people, clever people, are taking advantage of. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. So, from the perspective of a designer, the attributes of a good designer, now this is not a complete list. Um, the, an attribute of a good design is function. The phone has to work, I have to be able to clean uh, my kitchen floor using the broom. It should fill a need. My kitchen floor is messy, I have to clean it. It should be effective. Think about two different types of brooms. One has sparsely distributed hair, and uh, the other one has very densely uh, uh, distributed hair. That's gonna be more effective than the first one. And then there's a the vision. I Maybe if I lived at a time where people had not yet invented the broom, I could claim vision. I foresee that people are actually gonna need this tool and I'm going to invent it and maybe become rich. And then there's insight. Insight, um, you need to realize that um, there is such, a, a, that such, a, that such an object may actually be needed. And finally, it doesn't hurt if, uh, if it looks original but that may actually have no inf influence on its function, but it, you could have a funky looking broom and you could be very proud of that broom, but uh, uh, it may be an important parameter to me as a designer, but you as the consumer, it may not matter one way or the other. So these terms often describes the perspective of the designer. And some designers, they actually like to put an identifiable mark on their product. And Apple, for instance, um, and other Steve Jobs, uh, Products are examples of that, but in the airplane industry, there's a number of different kinds of airplanes that have a certain mark on them that you can say, well, this particular person was involved in designing it. So how about the user? Do the attributes of the design coincide with that of the designer? Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But the important thing, though, is that the consumer often has different attributes in mind than the designer and we don't want those to conflict. First of all is affordability. In my view, an iPhone is way, way too expensive. And, and the monthly bill is way, way, way too expensive. But I'm a sucker, and I use it, I fall for it. Durability, I 
a couple of uh, years ago, I went uh, to one of the department stores to buy a refrigerator and, um, and the washing machine, and the clerk there told me he was trying to sell me warranty, and he told me that these objects would only last for a year before they needed repairs. And so, so durability is very important to us as consumers, but you know, they may not necessarily be that important to the designer who maybe sees an opportunity to earn more money. Reliability. I want my fridge, my two-year-old fridge, by the way, it hasn't failed yet, but I want it every time I open the door, I want there to be a cold beverage in there. And it has been so far. So it's, it's reliable in that sense. And then we have maybe function and effectiveness, which actually match that of the designer, and aesthetics. And aesthetics, we want the thing, we, if we are paying uh, a lot of money for a particular product, we want to be able to show it off. If you buy an airplane, you want the airplane to look like the million dollars you just paid for it. Um, I think cellular phones are generally cool looking and it's sort of a status symbol for many people, uh, but aesthetics is a very important attribute. And then there is this one, and this is one of the most important ones. Is it safe to use? And that is often sometimes that when we get engrossed in our designs, we forget to think about, is this actually going to be safe for people? Is it going to kill somebody? So I'm going to focus on giving some examples of this. Um, and uh, it turns out, when it comes to airplanes, that we split them into two classes. We call, talk about conventional aircraft, we talk about unconventional aircraft. And obviously, they're called unconventional because they don't really look like what we're used to seeing. So the question is, why do we see this flying around and not this? So here in the upper left, we have a flying wing. We have in the middle there a so-called blended wing body design. We have a so-called Fovel wing. We have an asymmetric aircraft, we have an outside horizontal stabilator, and we have a tandem wing aircraft. And I bet that many of you here have never seen these airplanes before. Maybe the flying wing is the most likely one that you may have, may have seen. The thing is about that all of these designs that you just saw, they show an incredible insight, vision, and originality. And when you actually start looking into why they're designed in this particular manner, you realize that the people that designed them are actually very, very smart people. So let's take a look at some examples. Here's an example of a flying wing. It has a, um, a low drag forward fuselage that actually contributes to the total lift of the airplane. Because of the way the geometry is, there's a perfect blending of the fuselage into the wing, and that means that if this object flies fast, it is not going to be subject to what we call compressibility, or at least in a much, much lesser scale than conventional aircraft. The absence of vertical and horizontal tail reduces the drag further. For this particular airplane, which is propeller-driven, there are no adverse thrust effects. Actually, the only thrust effects that you would notice in such a vehicle would be uh, due to angular momentum, which would tend to back the vehicle um, but there would be nothing that the pilot couldn't handle. The smooth blending of the wing, you see the wing is actually split into a number of panels. The smooth blending of it eliminates interference drag. This should be a very sleek vehicle. You see, it's only a wing. It's, there should be few major assemblies, and this should reduce the production cost, and therefore it should be affordable. The generation of pitch stability, you know, here's a concept that I have to maybe elaborate a little on. It turns out that aircraft, all aircraft, need a certain minimum airspeed in order to become airborne. That this airspeed is very important to pilots and airplane designers, and it's, it's called a stalling speed. So when we stall an airplane, when the pilot stalls an airplane, what we want to happen, basically what would happen is this. When you're flying fast, the airplane has a low angle of attack. And when you slow down, if you slow down, you have to make up for the loss of lift by increasing the angle of attack of the airplane. Eventually, you can only do it to a certain uh, a number, a certain value, and if that happens, you basically stall the airplane, as the pilots call it, and it will typically fall on its nose. And, a, and an airplane that stalls gently will fall very straight on its nose, but there are airplanes that are, are a little bit um, uh, worse than that, and they will actually fall on one wing or the other, and that can actually start something called a spin, which may be a, a fatal condition in some aircraft because you can't recover from it. But it turns out, for a flying wing, 
that it has exceptional stall characteristics. And you will see in a moment why. So this is a flying wing. And what I'm showing with this image is that the lift, most of the lift is generated by the center section and the outboard, uh, 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 by the fuselage, the center section and the, um, the inboard part of the wings. And what you do is that you reduce the lift on the tip. And by doing that, you actually generate longitudinal stability, which is necessary for this airplane to fly. And you end up with something that looks like this bell-shaped lift distribution. Um, there is a, a common misunderstanding uh, among uh, lay people that you have to generate downward lift on the wingtips. In order to balance it, you don't need that. And you can easily verify it by thinking about the lift as being three strings. If you hold this object with three strings, you can see that all the strings are going to be stretched. And that's because they're all reacting the, the weight of the aircraft upward. Uh, the way you generate a directional stability with these airplanes, directional stability, think about an arrow. The reason why you have tail feathers on an arrow is because if you don't, it will start to tumble. So you have the tail feathers to stabilize it. It's just like a, a weather vane uh, for meteorolo meteorology. So the way you generate this directional stability, basically if you didn't generate it, the airplane would just tend to do something like this, is that you have these clamshell ailerons or clamshell control surfaces out there at the wingtip. You open them up, and that generates directional stability. You see that on the uh, B2 bomber there. Now, the thing, by doing this, uh, it actually changes the equation. And if you are, are in, enamored with the uh, benefits of the design, you may forget that maybe the benefits aren't all that great. Maybe they're fine. Maybe they're acceptable. But it is a balance between pros and cons that uh, some designers uh, fail to think about. For instance, one of the problems with this fuselage is that if this vehicle goes to a high angle of attack because of the geometry of the fuselage, it will actually be generating lift to a high, higher angle of attack. And that might actually take the vehicle and bring you to a very high angle of attack, and it might fall on its tail and be a very, very dangerous situation. Uh, the sweep back me means that the control surfaces are not as effective as they would be if it were a straight wing. And we have already talked about the seriously diminished directional stability. There's a simple problem, propeller clearance in this particular uh, configuration. Um, because of the propeller, when you need to take off or land, you have to lift the nose of the airplane, and there's a risk that you will strike the ground with the propeller. So to fix that, there's usually fixes to all of these things, you would have long landing gear. And if you have long landing gear, now you have very high landing loads that have to be reacted by the structure, so the structure ends up being heavier than you thought at first. The generation of pitch and di direction of stability is detrimental to the wing efficiency. And when I talk about wing efficiency, you're not going to get see all the uh, lift, uh, all the drag reduction that we went through uh, on the first uh, image of this vehicle. You're not going to realize it all because you have to generate the stability. And uh, it comes at a cost of added drag. The sweep back requires higher angle of attack. And so the problem is that you may end up uh, uh, when you uh, may not actually be able to do this stall that I was talking about. And that's very important. If you're designing an airplane, for instance, a single-engine aircraft, the FAA tells you that you have to be able to stall it at an airspeed less or equal to 61 knots or 70 miles per hour. And the, the problem with this design is that you may not be able to go that slowly because your, your uh, control surfaces become more... Uh, inefficient, or and it may not be able to reach that angle of attack, so, which means that you would have a higher, you might, in other words, not be able to certify the airplane because of it. And then the important one, really, is unconventional looks, coupled with a very limited operational history, may intimidate the flying public. And that is something that uh, designers tend to forget, is that their fancy-looking airplane or object may not necessarily appeal to the masses like it does to them. Um, here, is, here we have an asymmetric aircraft. Um, I'm running out of time, so I can't really go through this. But uh, an asymmetric airplane is a very clever airplane. Um, and um, here is a flying plank. Here is a tandem wing aircraft. Um, and here is another one. This actually is, has a very promising char characteristics. And, uh, but you see that all of these airplanes look very unusual to us. I will not have time to go through this. Here is an OHS aircraft. 
the horizontal tail resides in the, in the upwash from the wingtip and it actually generates stability while generating upward lift. So this is very unconventional for an aft tail uh, configuration. Um, th there are other uh, characteristics that are of interest also, but uh, you will kind of have to read this quickly. Uh, uh, so what are the lessons? The first is that originality and insight are very important in product development, but they also increase the risk of failure. Originality and insight are often far more important to the designer than they are to the end user. And this can cause a project to be doomed from the get-go. Uh, so don't let the originality of your design, uh, don't let that, use that to, uh, to basically direct you in, in one way or one direction or another. Uh, the user actually prefers safety over your originality. Um, so the primary problems with unconventional aircraft design is lack or absence of safety history, lack or absence of development history, lack or absence of operational history, and resistance of the flying public. public. They may not necessarily like it. So um, it turns also out that many of these designs, that they may, they may look simpler and more efficient, but they actually, because they are so unknown, that's actually going to inflict higher development cost on it and you're likely going to sell fewer units of them. So therefore, the development cost is going to be spread over fewer numbers of airplanes, and consequently, uh, they're going to be more expensive. So I urge you to proceed with the dream of a unique design. However, be realistic. Don't fall in love with your design until nature and the FAA give you the green light. That's a thing that many people forget. Uh, and here are some important, finally, important sentences that you do not want to hear from your design team. Oops, I didn't think it through. And it seems like a good idea at the time. And that's it. <laughs>